are for when you're interviewing and then doing um, in data analysis when you have your interviews transcribed and you're maybe working in your teams to start thinking about um, writing up results. So when you're creating interview questions, uh, I'm sure you've all written questions before, or asked questions to other people, and it's very different when you are asking questions to your friends as when you're asking questions to maybe a policymaker if you're in that role. Um, so what you want to do is to consider who you're interviewing, right? And you want to consider um, what your context is. So if you're going to interview a policymaker, do you think they'll give you an hour of their time to be interviewed for your research? Probably not. So you wanna consider the number of questions that you'll be asking and the amount of time that you have. So you don't want to overwhelm someone with 100 questions to get at uh, the, the ideas that you want them to talk about. You maybe want to pare it down and consider, well, we have 20 minutes, maybe four questions is the realistic number of questions we can ask in that amount of time. You want to consider asking some open-ended questions as well as some closed-ended questions. Open-ended questions are the ones that really get people talking. You would ask someone, how are you feeling today? And they can answer in any way they want. If you ask a closed-ended question, oh, you look tired, you must not feel well today, do you feel okay today? And they don't really have a, much choice but to say yes or no in that sense. So a closed-ended question will kind of close the conversation and not give you much information. So if you ask a closed-ended question, which is often necessary, like, um, do you like eating pizza? And somebody says yes, and you're like, oh, well, what kind of pizza? And then you can get them talking more about that subject. Uh, and it's often good to have both types of questions so that you know if those questions that you want to ask are relevant to people. So have you ever gone skiing and somebody says no, well then you're not going to ask what kind of skis they used and where they went. When you're writing your questions, you never want to ask in the same moment two questions. So if I would ask, do you like pizza and do you like ice cream? If they said yes, you're not sure if they like pizza or ice cream or both. So make sure to always just ask one question at a time because then when you go back to data analysis, it's very clear that you asked this question and you got this response. Don't use jargon. Uh, this might be okay if you're interviewing policymakers or other scientists or people who know the research field that you're in. Uh, today, you'll be doing um, some interviews both with the general public and then some people who will be playing different roles of ranchers, policymakers, and environmentalists. So you want to think about your interviewees, who you're interviewing, what types of questions they might uh, be able to understand, the types of words you can use, the jargon. You know, if you're interviewing a policymaker, you could probably use some jargon or specific terms. Uh, like IPBES, people would probably know that if they're in that field, but the general public probably doesn't know that concept. When you're handing somebody or you're talking with somebody in an interview, um, whoever is doing the interview needs to have some kind of instructions for how to flow through your protocol. So if you have 10 questions and you're working with other researchers like you'll be doing today, uh, you want to make sure that they can understand the flow of the interview. So you don't just jump in and say, oh, good morning. Um, let's start talking about IPBES today. You, you want to give them some background. You want to introduce your topic. You want to say why you're doing the research you're doing. And then for the interviewer, the person who's going to be interviewing, uh, maybe they didn't write the question. Maybe they aren't familiar with why they're asking the questions to who the person that they're interviewing. So you want to have uh, a bit of information for them to say, okay, the next set of questions is about this. Um, if someone answers no to this question, skip to section C rather than continuing on so that they have a guide for how to go through the interview. Uh, again, you want to group your questions by topic. You don't want to start out by asking 
do you like skiing? Oh, great, yeah, me too, and have this conversation about skiing, and then say, now let's talk about grasslands, and then at the end of the interview, you go back to talking about skiing. You wanna keep the same ideas uh, by question grouped together so that your conversation can flow more naturally. It's always important to collect demographic information. Uh, you might think you'll remember who you interviewed, if it was a male or female, uh, how old they were, but when you go back to data collection or data analysis, even years later or working with other people, um, you might not be able to remember who you interviewed, who they were. So asking demographic questions to the person, um, if it's appropriate. Sometimes you don't wanna ask somebody how old they are or if they um, make a certain amount of money. So you always wanna be sensitive to what kind of questions you're asking to whom. And you can ask these as kind of icebreakers at the beginning of the interview, kind of to set the stage, make it easy for them to start opening up and saying, oh, I, I feel comfortable here. I know the answers to these questions. You can also end with those questions in uh, the opposite sense where you're wrapping things up They've gone through all the hard parts, and now this is kind of the, okay, we'll get the easy questions toward the end, and they know it's wrapping up and that you're almost finished. So you can make a choice of when to include those types of questions. And when you're going through and writing your interview questions, like you'll be doing today, you always wanna keep your, your research question in mind. So if you're working with natural scientists, and thinking about grasslands, but you're going to be interviewing uh, policymakers, maybe about a larger issue. Every time you write a question, think about why you're asking that question and how it might be important. You don't want to throw in extra questions that will waste time or maybe frustrate your interviewer, your interviewee. So it looked like about half of you have experience interviewing. Um, it's fairly simple, but you want to make sure to discuss your rules and how you're going to do the interviewing with your, your group members. And when you actually get there and you're sitting across from or next to your, interviewing, your interviewee, um, you want to make sure to break the ice. Like we did uh, in the improv group, it kind of, we got people up and moving, chit-chatting maybe about random topics or you know you see people in the morning at breakfast you ask oh how are you doing what's the weather like outside just to make people feel comfortable and build some trust you want to set the stage or make sure that you're letting people know why they're being interviewed how you're going to use that information and maybe in some cases who the funders were if it's appropriate and when you're asking your questions, you want to make sure that you ask the question the same way every time. And if you're working with other people who will maybe do, be doing interviews apart from you, you want to make sure that they're asking the same questions in the same way, using the same language you are. And so if you have some terms that are very specific or ideas that are very specific, if people start in reinterpreting them and asking them in different ways at different times, uh, the interviewees might uh, respond differently based on who's asking the question and how they're asking it. So when you're going back to do data analysis, this becomes very important because you want to be able to compare across all interviews to say, okay, we asked the same question to everybody and here's how they responded. It's important to always use clear, basic language when you're interviewing. Um, and this is especially important if you're doing it in a language that's not your native language. I do my interviews in Mexico and Spanish, which is not my native language, and so a lot of times I get stuck on words that I just can't pronounce or that are unfamiliar to me, and so we practice beforehand, and if there's a word I just cannot say, like sustentabilidad had been a really hard one for me for a long time, we came up with another word and then all agreed to use the other word instead. You want to make sure to always address all of your questions and topics that you had planned on. So if you're 
asking somebody some questions and you really want to get through the protocol as it's planned and laid out, but the interviewee really just wants to keep talking about this one subject and keeps bringing back maybe um, the destruction of a hurricane, and that's the only thing in their mind they can think of, it's your job to make sure that you always ask all of the questions in your protocol even if the person keeps redirecting you or maybe they answer some questions before you've asked them, you still wanna revisit those questions and say, I know you talked about this already and this is what I heard, is that true? Can you say more about that? Um, and make sure that all of your questions are asked. Make sure to be a good listener. It's never fun when somebody you ask somebody a question how are you today? And they start to answer, like, oh, well, you know, and then you put words in their mouth, oh, you must have slept poorly, and that's not really what happened. It, um, you know, you don't get the information you want. They might be thrown off and say, oh, I, I'm not gonna be able to say anything, this person keeps interrupting me. So just be a good listener, ask your question, and then kind of sit back and let them say what they want to say. If somebody goes on for too long and says too much, it's also your job to kind of then interrupt and say, okay, well, let's get back to the question. Can you, you know, we can move on to the next one and go from there. Probing is something that you do to get more information about a topic. So if you've asked a question that you planned on asking and then somebody answers in a way that you didn't expect or gives you information that you didn't expect to hear or didn't know, then you can ask, oh, a follow-up question, can you tell me more about this one piece that you said? And if enough people that you're interviewing keep talking about that same topic, then you can add that bit of information in as a new question. Um, as long as everybody on the research team agrees and the protocols are followed, it could be a good way to um, use the interviewee's knowledge to build on your research question. You can act like Homer Simpson when you're an interviewer, and that just means play dumb. You're in the, the interview process thinking that you already know what people are going to say. You have some questions that you think they might know the answer to, but again, they might have their own perspective and something um, that you didn't anticipate that they would say or that they, you already know kind of what they're going to say, but you wanna hear it from their perspective and in their own words. So if somebody says, oh, I've been to Calgary many times and I like Banff, you don't wanna say, oh yeah, I've been there too. You'd say, oh, tell me more about Banff. What do you like about Banff? And just act dumb and act like you've never heard about Banff and ask more questions to get more information in that person's own words. At the end of your interview, you always want to make sure to ask if they have any questions about the research. Uh, you can always direct them to the principal investigator if you don't have the answer that they're at, to a question they're asking. And then always make sure to say thank you for their time. Even if somebody didn't really give you much information, maybe the interview was five minutes and it had to be cut short, always be appreciative of their time because n none of us want to waste our time um, being interviewed or have our din dinner interrupted by someone knocking on our front door. So it's always good to say, well, thank you very much for your time, even if it's a very short amount of time. How many people here, if you've done interviews or if you haven't, have done qualitative data analysis with interview data before? Okay, great. Uh, what happens after you interview someone, and often you take notes and you record the interview so that you have audio file that records exactly what was said. Um, and then it's important to have someone take notes, which we'll be practicing today too, because then if their tape recorder fails, if there are loud dogs barking in the audio that you can't hear the person speaking, um, you can always refer back to your notes uh, and even have some additional notes about where you did the interview, if their kids were there running around and distracting them, some little bits of information to remind you about the setting. So the interview um, data comes from you listening to your audio file often and transcribing it word for word so that you have a transcript of what was said. 
You'll want to go back and reread through all of those notes when you get home or when you get back to your office. And you kind of jog your memory, oh, this is what that person was talking about. And then you read the next interview, that's what that person was talking about. And you start to see and think about common themes that come up through the interviews. Um, when you're working in groups, this is especially important to do and maybe talk about after you've reread through the interviews one time to say, oh, I noticed this in this community and these policymakers were talking about this issue and see um, if they have the same types of, uh, if they saw the same themes and heard the same things that you were hearing. And when you're reading through the data, when you go back in a second or third time even, you start to go in and methodically identify the patterns that you see. So if you're working on IPBES framework and the concept of water governance, when you go in and start seeing, okay, here's where governance comes up in these terms, here's where water comes up in these terms, and you can physically highlight them in a notebook and see, okay, in all of the yellow highlights, that means that water was talked about. Um, in green, that's where governance was talked about. And you can start to collect that information in that way. There's also uh, interviewing qualitative data analysis software that you can use that will help you um, collect and, and collate that information so you can go back and see, OK, across all interviews, water was talked about in these ways. When you're working in groups, it's really important to start comparing those themes or those that coded information to make sure that you're on the same page. If you're going to be talking about grasslands like you will be today, you don't want to be thinking about um, the concept of foraging. Is that one of the concepts, Valentina? <laughs> foraging um, and overgrazing in certain terms while others are thinking about it in other terms. So you want to compare your notes and say, yeah, this is the concept of grazing and how it was talked about so that you're all on the same page as uh, Lily and Gabby were talking about this morning. So you can c code and then recode your data multiple times to make sure you get the broad picture of what people were saying and then also the maybe finer details once you identify the main concepts that you want to look more closely at. And then as you're going through and rereading or re-listening to your interviews, you want to make sure to listen for exemplary quotes, things that people said that really get at, okay, this is what this group of people have to say about water governance and here's something that someone said that really captures that idea in their own words and you know often this is used in a press release like Allison talked about yesterday this can be used in your um, publications to illustrate here's here's what people are saying in their own words and it can be used um, to say show the differences between groups here's what policymakers were saying and here's what ranchers were saying So now I'll take any questions you might have, and we can also talk about this as you're creating your questions because something that I haven't covered might come up as you're writing your questions, but does anybody have any questions right now? Valentin. So you mentioned that uh, everybody in the group who's doing the uh, analysis of the interviews should read the interviews and discuss and agree on common themes. Uh, is it okay to that one person does that? Uh, and and or, or you need something. several people and uh, to to do it. Kathy can answer this better than me, maybe, but um, I, I mean, yes, you can. You can be working on your own, and maybe Naomi has something to say about if you're doing ethno ethnography and work on your own in the field, and you're the only one who has the data and has been there, you don't really have anybody else to talk with about it, right? But 
Um, I think it's always helpful to have somebody else look at your themes and reread some of your interview notes, or even if you were in the field taking field notes, to have them reread those to get a sense of, okay, here's, here's what the setting was like, here are the um, things that they observed, and here are the, the overarching topics that emerged. Yeah, I, th I think ideally, um, when you're doing a group project, you have more than one person kind of thinking, talking, and looking, and reading, and just and agreeing to what your themes are going to be that you use. So, as in your groups of four, as you are moving toward analyzing the data, you probably want to talk to each other about what are going to be your themes or your codes. Yeah. You add anything? And what Pablo, I think Pablo said it yesterday, um, it's always nice to have fresh eyes look at something or think, think differently about it because if you're so narrowly focused on, okay, this is what water governance means to me and to our research, but then it doesn't really apply to the larger literature or to a wider audience, then you kind of get, um, you have blinders on. Yeah, I would agree with both uh, what you and Kathy have said. Um, I would add that um, if you're going to try to publish it, um, you want to have what's called intercoder reliability. So one way to get at that is if you have a transcript of your interview or even just you've typed up your notes to the answers that you got to the question, and then you imagine you're going to take ex excerpts from that interview and you're going to get put it under a theme. For example, degradation of the landscape, motivations to degrade the landscape, and you're putting that, that answer underneath that theme. Then you would go to someone else, maybe with some experience with interviewing or with another team member, and saying, this is how I'm coding this interview. I'm putting that statement under this theme. And it, you could have a discussion about it or you could independently do it and see if you came up with the same ways of categorizing the answers that you got. And then if you usually won't come up with exactly the same and then that's a point of discussion so that the future interviews that you code, you do consistently. Because you, what you don't want is different people putting different answers to the questions under different categories. Because then when you go to write it up, it won't be consistent. It won't. It won't be coherent. Okay. Who, I, who had to um, it up? Okay. Is there? Okay. Apart from direct. I don't. You're, I don't think your mic is working. It's not working. I yeah. I don't think so. Maybe I'm going to try this one. You have a soft voice. Mm -hmm. All right. You can hear me? Yes. OK, good. Um, apart from direct quotes, um, how can you visually depict uh, qualitative analysis um, to show how you know, themes interrelate and so on? Is there a, yeah, apart from direct quotes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the software that I've used in the past is called InVivo. And there are other ones out there that you can use where you upload your transcripts, and you can go from the very beginning before you've even done any interviews and lay out a conceptual map of, OK, here's what we believe is happening, or here's just the stakeholders we're going to interview and how they might be connected. And then as you use the software and upload your data into it, uh, you can do lots of different things kind of with the click of a mouse, you can create word clouds with the words that are most often used. And so you could see, well, we thought we were interviewing about water governance, but more so people were talking about um, water quality or the problems with pollution. Uh, there's also uh, word trees and network maps that can be created with this software. So you have to do some of the background the, the legwork to prepare that software. Uh, it doesn't do it automatically, but you, the way you code and label things, um, it can help you visualize, well, Maria kept talking about water in this location, and Jorge was also talking about water in that location. Maybe they have something in common that you know we would have never thought of. Um, and there's also, I think, it's, Based on your conceptual map, you can create 
uh, hierarchies that show the themes that came out after you've coded. It'll show the themes that came out based on your conceptual map and how those might be linked. And so those are ways to visualize either with schematics or Venn diagrams how your information might be uh, visualized and, and then thought of in a new way.